Thanks a lot, Laurie. Thanks a lot to the program of financial studies for inviting me to present here. This is the, the presentation today is based on uh, our research agenda with uh, Veronica Rappaport and Danny Wolfenson, uh, colleagues at Columbia, and, and Philip Schnabel at NYU. And the, so I'm going to present bits and pieces of different parts of this research. But the, the motivation for this research comes from, from the combination of an old question in finance and some new patterns in trade that were observed after the financial, during the financial crisis. The old question in, in, in finance is basically a asks what is the role of banks in propagating uh, financial shocks and, uh, and amplifying economic fl fluctuations. And the story, the story behind this research, or the theory behind this research is the following. During an economic downturn, the asset prices get affected, the fault rates go up, and the balance sheets of banks suffer. As a result of this, the ability of banks to issue loans is reduced. And on the other side, you have then firms that are bank dependent. They, they feel credit constraint, their output suffers, and that ends up aggravating the, the economic downturn that you, had, and that you had in the first place. This, is, this, this idea has been studied since the Great Depression. Ben Bernanke, before becoming salient and famous for QE2, he was actually famous for this in, uh, uh, by uh, introducing the idea that banks can act as a resonance box uh, for economic activity during times of, 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 of recessions, of economic downturns. The, the connection, this, this idea or this, this discussion spilled over into the debate of, uh, of uh, international trade during the crisis because of the massive decline in exports during 2008 and 2009. During 2009 alone, exports fell 23%, uh, and that, that decline was more than uh, was disproportionate if you compare it to the decline in GDP during the same period, global GDP. Uh, and that, this has led people to ask themselves, well, to which degree did finance have to do with this disproportionate effect on, or the, the availability of finance to exporters uh, caused this amplified reaction by, of, of, uh, of exporters. And um, the reasons to think why there's a connection, exporters are heavy in the use of working capital. Their cash cycles are just simply longer than just the firms are selling domestically. And, um, and exporters you make very heavy use of, of bank-specific services like, like letters of credit and insurance, especially new exporters. Okay? So uh, what we are going to try to is to put these two things together and ask the, the very specific question we want to ask is whether, um, whether crisis or uh, you know, um, international financial shocks affect the export performance of, of, of firms. And, uh, and you, can, you can see immediately what the problem, at least the empirical problem, the, the, we're going to ask this question empirically, the, immediately the empirical problem that you face is if you see output going down of exporters, so ex exporters going down, is it because the you know, demand is going down and the, the economic conditions are bad? Or is it because the banks are not lending to the firms? And this is, this is precisely the type of problem that when you do research, so empirical research, you try to you try to uncover. We're going to use data for Peru. Why for Peru? So for Peru is the only country in the world in which the, the data, the customs data, detailed <coughs> custom data, is publicly available. So if you're interested in, in knowing how much, how many alpaca sweaters, alpaca is this furry uh, llama, right? Uh, these alpaca, alpaca sweaters Peru exported in 2007, you go into a web page of Sunat. Sunat is the equivalent of the IRS in, in Peru. And you type in alpaca sweaters, and it will tell you how many sweaters were exported, at what price, what sizes of the, the sweater were, what the content of alpaca was, who exported them, to which country, they were, everything, okay? Where they were striped or e everything about the, the, the exports, okay? And this is, this is publicly available on the web, and we designed a, a web crawler uh, to download every single export document from Peru since 1995. The, the, we could match this data with data on a credit register. Credit registries are data, data sets held by, by central banks in many countries that keep track of every credit transaction in the, in the, in the country with, with, between the formal uh, banking sector and firms. When you put these two, data, these two data sets together, it means that you have a very long time series of the universe of firms, of the entire credit history and their entire export history. history. What do we do with this? So, well, before, before doing that, let me just show you the time series of exports in Peru. There's another reason why Peru is interesting to study this is precisely they, they have been an outstanding export performer uh, in Latin America during the last decade. 
There, these are exports in, uh, in, in values. You can see, the, you can see the, the tremendous growth with some, of course, some volatility, but the tremendous growth uh, during the last decade, and you see the effect of the crisis. This, this massive drop in exports, this is not particular about Peru, world exports dropped more or less in the same proportion during, the, during a couple of months uh, that followed um, the, the end of 2008. So the, the goal, just to remind you what the goal is, the goal at, at the end of, of this talk is going to be to explain how much of that massive decline that you see there in this, at the end of this graph, how much of that decline was caused by the lack or exporters being credit constrained because their local banks didn't lend to them. Okay? That's, that's going to be the key. What's the idea? How do we do this? So the idea is going to be to exploit the... the International capital flow reversals during a crisis. It's the very common during, during, gener during, not just during this crisis, but every crisis, every, um, as a shock to the available fi funding to banks. On the, on the plot on the left-hand side, what, you can s what we have there is the total amount of foreign borrowing by the banking sector in, in Peru. And um, what you can see is that the foreign liabilities were increasing. Uh, there was this increasing trend. Um, all the way back to 2007, and uh, mid-2008, this trend stops and actually reverts. This, this, is, this actually is not, not just typical for banking sectors, it's typical for countries as a whole. When you have flight to quality during times of macroeconomic uncertainty, capital flows out of emerging markets. Okay? Now, this is, although this is true for the entire country, it's not true that, the, 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 it's not true that all banks were equally affected by this. On the right-hand side, you have a table of the top commercial banks in Peru um, classified by their, the share of their assets financed with foreign liabilities. And you can see, for example, banks like HSBC and Citibank that finance 17, 10% of their total assets with foreign liabilities. And then you have banks like Santander, just to name the, the large uh, international ones, uh, that finances only 2% of its assets with foreign liabilities. So for the same capital flow reversal, <coughs> aggregate capital flow reversals, you'll have differential effects on different types of banks. Okay? So the idea is the following. Use this cross-sectional heterogeneity to estimate our effect. Think of the following. You have Bank A, let's say Citibank, HSBC, that has a large share of foreign liabilities. Bank B that has a low share of foreign liabilities. The, the, the idea is to compare the exports of two firms, one of them borrowing from one bank, the other one borrowing from the other. Now, of course, the, the premise is that, is that lending and exports by the, the, the firm that's linked to the bank with high foreign liabilities are going to drop more. But we know that firms <coughs> and banks are not matched randomly. So there are reasons why you borrow from HSBC and not Santander. Um, so the idea here is to use the extreme detail of the export data. Instead of comparing total exports of the firms, compare the exports at the product destination level. This is an example just following the alpaca sweater example. We want to compare exports of alpaca sweaters to the US across two firms, and then compare product by product and destination by destination, pair them up, and then do that comparison. Think about what this does. If there's any shock to the price of alpaca, it will, in principle, affect both, two things, both firms the same way. If there's any shock or any change in the global demand for sweaters, it should, in principle, affect the two firms the same way. If there's any shock that's, that's destination-specific, for example, US retailers, the demand for sweaters go down, or US retailers themselves are financial constrained because of the financial crisis, that also should, in principle, affect both, both firms at th the same way. So that's our trick to deal with, uh, with all demand factors. What's, so it's kind of a residual way. If, we take, if you take out everything that has to do with demand, it has to do that what, what remains is credit supply. So the results can be summarized in, in two pictures. This is a picture, this is a, a plot of, of lending by, on the, on the vertical axis, we've plotted the, lo, the, out, the log of the total outstanding loans um, by, by the two types of banks, banks with high share of foreign liabilities and low share of foreign liabilities, where we just made the cut. It's kind of arbitrary, but if you think, look at this table, we made the cut at Citi. So the, we're basically comparing lending by HSBC, Mi Banco, Continental, and Citi uh, relative to the rest. The, the solid line uh, are the total loans outstanding by these four banks. The dashed lines are the total loans outstanding by the rest of the banks. What you can see is that they move in parallel all the way up to 
uh, middle of 2000, the beginning of 2008. Actually, that, that big drop there, the clients, uh, that, that coincides actually with Bear, the month after Bear Stearns. Um, what you can see is precisely that, that lending by the banks that were, have, have had a high reliance on foreign liabilities drops dramatically relative to the, if you want, the control group of banks. Now, this is lending. This doesn't use the, the trade data. What this plot does, it's one way of summarizing the results. This plot shows the average exports by firms borrowing from these exposed banks relative to the average exports of the firms not exposed that borrow from, from the other group of banks, but compared product destination by product destination. Okay, it's kind of an average of all these things. Um, and because the numbers are relatively small, pre pre precisely because now we're comparing within a product destination, not aggregate numbers. But you can see it's a very similar pattern that you saw in the, in the, in the, in the lending plot. You see that, that exports are increasing. So this gives you the net effect of finance on exports. The, what you see is exports growing all the way up to middle 2008, and there's a, a sharp decline, and then they continue growing again. Okay? So this is, you know, in, a, in, in a picture, this is the, the, the effect of what we interpret as the effect of, of the credit supply shock, of the negative credit supply shock on, these, on, on the exports of these firms. Now you can put these pictures into and do some more fancy econometrics and actually decompose all the effects here and estimate actual elasticities and get actual numbers on this. So what we do is we get the, in a process that's, that's too long to explain in this, in this venue, we, we obtain a number for the actual dec decline in credit supply by exposed banks. The estimate is around 16% um, during the months that followed uh, that capital flow reversals. And we find, we find that a 10% decline in, uh, in, uh, in the average amount of financing received by a firm induces a, a 2% uh, decline in the, in the flow of the volume of exports, not taking out prices, in the volume of exports of firms that continue exporting. This is without, so we're de decomposing it between the effect on exports by firms that continue exporting and the effect on, on firms that actually uh, drop out of the market. So the effect on the firms that continue exporting is 2.3%. Um, and a 10% decline in bank financing reduces the number of exporting firms in 3.6%. So it has, it has a substantial effect both in the continuation margin of exporting and in the intensive margin. How much, given that you continue exporting, how much do you export? Now with these numbers, then we can go back to the original question. How much of the total decline in exports can we explain through the pure supply, credit supply shock? And the answer, the answer is, the bottom line is 15%. The, of that total decline in, the, in, in, in exports during, the, during the, the months following the crisis, 15% of that can be explained through the supply shock, given the numbers that we're obtaining. If you think about it, you can also decompose it into its, into its two components. The way, the way trade people think about trade during the crisis is, is, in, is in the, from the perspective of missing trade. If you think about this pre and post period, the year before and the year after the crisis, export growth in volumes was 3.2% before the crisis. Export growth during the year of the crisis was minus 9.6%. The difference between these two numbers they refer to as missing trade. So there's 12 percentage points of export growth that went missing during the crisis. The 15% of that is, can be explained by the, the supply of credit. What's something that's salient here is that a big chunk of, the, of that explanatory power comes from the change in exporting by firms that continue exporting. And this is key because this implies that the, that the effect through which the, finan the, the credit shortage is operating is through variable costs. It actually has to do with working capital. And this is salient for, for, for several reasons, in, but from a, an academic perspective, we are trained as financial economists to think that if finance matters for real outcomes, it, 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 it matters through investment in, in capital goods. And what this is saying, and this might be absolutely true in the long run when you're thinking about overall access of, of, uh, to credit and, and over, you know, depth of financial markets and stuff, but when you think about short-term fluctuations in credit, it seems that the, the main effect in terms of output is coming through working capital. Okay? So to conclude, I think I'm, I'm done with my 15 minutes, the, the banks there's several conclusions here. Banks do propagate real shocks internationally. So remember Peru, banks in Peru were not exposed to real estate in the US, did not hold any subprime anything, and still their, their, their credit, uh, they, they had to cut their supply of credit. 
short-term fluctuations in credit supply affect international trade. Uh, it, the effect is important in general, they don't, but they don't explain much of the decline, just 15% of the overall decline. Clearly, the rest of the decline was due to demand factors. Okay? And finally, the effect works through working capital, which is, which is salient because we're not used to thinking about real effects operating through working capital. We're, we're used to thinking about real effects operating through investment in capital goods. Thank you.